Chapter Fifteen of Lonesome Land by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen, A Compact. The blackened prairie was fast hiding the mark of its fire torture under a cloak of tender new grass, vividly green as a freshly watered, well kept lawn. Meadow larks hopped here and there, searching long for a sheltered nesting place and missing the weeds where they were wont to sway and swell their yellow breasts and sing at the sun. They sang just as happily, however, on their short, low flights over the levels, or sitting upon gray, half-buried boulders upon some barren hilltop. Spring had come with lavish warmth. The smoke of burning ranges, the bleak winter with its sweeping storms of snow and wind, were pushed into the past half forgotten in this new heaven and new earth, when men were glad simply because they were alive. On a still Sunday morning, that day which, when work does not press, is set apart in the rangeland for slight errands, attention to one's personal affairs, and to the pursuit of pleasure, Kent jogged placidly down the long hill into Cold Spring Coulee, and pulled up at the familiar little unpainted house of rough boards, with its incongruously dainty curtains at the windows, and its tiny yard, green and scrupulously clean. The cat with white spots on its sides was washing its face on the kitchen doorstep. Val was kneeling beside the front porch, painstakingly stringing white grocery twine upon nails which she drove into the rough posts with a small rock. The primitive trellis which resulted was obviously intended for the future encouragement of the sweet-pea plants, just unfolding their second clusters of leaves an inch above ground. She did not see Kent at first, and he sat quiet in his saddle, watching her with a flicker of amusement in his eyes but in a moment she struck her finger and sprang up with a sharp little cry, throwing the rock from her. "'Didn't you know that was going to happen sooner or later?' Kent inquired, and so made known his presence. "'Oh, how do you do?' She came smiling down to the gate, holding the hurt finger tightly clasped in the other hand. "'How comes it you are riding this way?' Our trail is all growing up to grass, so few ever travel it. We're all hard-working folks these days. Where's Man? Manley is down to the river, I think. She rested both arms upon the gatepost and regarded him with her steady eyes. If you can wait, he will be back soon. He only went to see if the river is fordable. He thinks two or three of our horses are on the other side, and he'd like to get them. The river has been too high, but it's lowering rather fast. Won't you come in? She was pleasant. She was unusually friendly. But Kent felt vaguely that, somehow, she was different. He had not seen her for three months. Just after Christmas, he had met her in Manley in town, when he was about to leave for a visit to his people in Nebraska. He had returned only a week or so before, and if the truth were known, he was not displeased at the errand which brought him this way. He dismounted, and when she moved away from the gate, he opened it and went in. "'Well,' he began lightly, when he was seated upon the floor of the porch and she was back at her trellis, "'and how's the world been treating you?' "'Had any more calamities while I've been gone?' She busied herself with tying together two pieces of string, so that the hole would reach to a certain nail driven higher than her head. She stood with both hands uplifted, and her face and her eyes. She did not reply for so long that Kent began to wonder if she had heard him. There was no reason why he should watch her so intently, or why he should want to get up and push back the one lock of hair which seemed always in rebellion and always falling across her temple by itself. He was drifting into a dreamy wonder that all women with yellow-brown hair should not be given yellow-brown eyes also, and to wishing vaguely that it might be his luck to meet one sometime, 
one who was not married, when she looked down at him quite unexpectedly. He was startled and half ashamed, and afraid that she might not like what he had been thinking. She was staring straight into his eyes, and he knew that she was thinking of something that affected her a good deal. "'Unless it's a calamity to discover that the world is, what it is and people in it are, what they are, and that you have been a blind idiot. Is that a calamity, Mr. Cowboy? Or is it a blessing? I've been wondering.' Kent discovered, when he started to speak, that he had run short of breath. "'I reckon that depends on how the discovery pans out,' he ventured, after a moment. He was not looking at her then. For some reason, unexplained to himself, he felt that it wasn't right for him to look at her, nor wise, nor quite pleasant in its effect. He did not know exactly what she meant, but he knew very well that she meant something more than to make conversation. That she said, and gave a little sigh. That takes so long, don't you know? The panning out, as you call it. It's hard to see things very clearly, and to make a decision that you know is going to stand the test, and then just sit down and fold your hands, because some sordid, pretty little reason absolutely prevents your doing anything. I hate waiting for anything, don't you? When I want to do a thing, I want to do it immediately. These sweet peas. Now, I've fixed the trellis for them to climb upon. I resent it because they don't take hold right now. Nasty little things, two inches high when they should be two yards, and all covered with beautiful blossoms. Not the last of April, he qualified. Give them a fair chance, can't you? They'll make it all right. Things take time. She laughed surrenderingly, and came and sat down upon the porch near him, and tapped a slipper toe nervously upon the soft green sod. "'Time, yes!' She threw back her head and smiled at him brightly, and appealingly, it seemed to Kent. "'You remember what you told me once, about sheep herders and such going crazy out here? The such is sometimes ready to agree with you. She turned her head with a quick impatience. "'Such is learning to ride a horse,' she informed him airily. "'Such does it on the sly, and she fell off once and skinned her elbow, and she—well, such hasn't any side-saddle, but she's learning by Granny.' Kent laughed unsteadily and looked sidelong at her with eyes alight. She matched the glance for just about one second— and turned her eyes away with a certain consciousness that gave Kent a savage delight. Of a truth, she was different. She was human, she was intolerably alluring. She was not the prim, perfectly well-bred young woman he had met at the train. Lonesome Land was doing its work. She was beginning to think as an individual, as a woman, not merely as a member of conventional society. "'Such is beginning to be the proper stuff, by Granny,' he told her softly. He was afraid his tone had offended her. She rose, and her color flared and faded. She leaned slightly against the post beside her, and with a hand thrown up and half-shielding her face, she stared out across the coulee to the hill beyond. "'Did you—I feel like a fool for talking like this—' but one sometimes clutches at the least glimmer of sympathy and and understanding and speaks what should be kept bottled up inside i suppose but i've been bottled up for so long she struck her free hand suddenly against her lips as if she would apply physical force to keep them from losing all self-control when she spoke again her voice was calmer did you ever get to the point, Mr. Cowboy, where you—you you dug right down to the bottom of things, and found that you must do something or go mad, and there wasn't a thing you could do? Did you ever?" She did not turn toward him, but kept her eyes to the hills. 
when he did not answer however she swung her head slowly and looked down at him where he sat almost at her feet kent was leaning forward studying the gashes he had cut in the sod with his spurs his brows were knitted close i kind of think i'm getting there pretty fast he owned gravely when he felt her gaze upon him why oh because you can understand how one must speak sometimes ever since i came you have been i don't know different at first i didn't like you at all but i could see you were different since then well you have now and then said something that made me see one could speak to you and you would understand so i she broke off suddenly and laughed an apology am i boring you dreadfully one grows so self-centered living alone if you aren't interested i am kent was obliged to clear his throat to get those two words out go on say all you want to say she laughed again wearily lately she confessed nervously i've taken to telling my thoughts to the cat it's perfectly safe but after all it isn't quite satisfying she stopped again and stood silent for a moment it's because i am alone day after day week in and week out she went on in a way i don't mind it under the circumstances i prefer to be alone really i mean i wouldn't want any of my people near me but one has too much time to think i tell you this because i feel i ought to let you know that you were right that time i don't suppose you even remember it but i do once last fall the first time you came to the ranch you know the time i met you at the spring you seemed to see that this big lonesome country was a little too much for me i resented it then i didn't want anyone to tell me what i refused to admit to myself i was trying so hard to like it it seemed my only hope you see but now i'll tell you you were right sometimes i feel very wicked about it sometimes i don't care and sometimes i i feel i shall go crazy if i can't talk to someone nobody comes here except polycarp jenks the only woman i know really well in the country is arline hawley she's good as gold but she's intensely practical you can't tell her your troubles not unless they're concrete and have to do with your physical well-being arline lacks imagination she laughed again shortly i don't know why i'm taking it for granted you don't she said you think i'm talking poor nonsense don't you mr cowboy she turned full toward him and her yellow-brown eyes challenged him begged him for sympathy and understanding held him at bay but most of all they set his blood pounding sullenly in his veins he got unsteadily to his feet you seem to pass up a lot of things that count or you wouldn't say that he reminded her huskily that night in town just after the fire for instance and here that same afternoon i tried to jollow you out of feeling bad both those times but you know i understood you know damn well i understood and you know i was sorry and if you don't know i'd do anything on god's green earth he turned sharply away from her and stood kicking savagely backward at a clod with his rowel then he felt her hand touch his arm and started after that he stood perfectly still except that he quivered like a frightened horse oh it doesn't mean much to you you have your life and you're a man and can do things when you want to but i do so need a friend just somebody who understands to whom i can talk when that is the only thing will keep me sane you saved my life once so i feel no i don't mean that it isn't because of anything you did it's just that i feel i can talk to you more freely than to anyone i know i don't mean wine i hope i'm not a whiner 
if i've blundered i'm willing to to take my medicine as you would say but if i can feel that somewhere in this big empty country just one person will always feel kindly toward me and wish me well and be sorry for me when i when i'm miserable and she could not go on she pressed her lips together tightly and winked back the tears kent faced about and laid both his hands upon her shoulders his face was very tender and rather sad and if she had only understood as well as he did but she did not little woman listen here he said you're playing hard luck and i know it maybe i don't know just how hard but maybe i can kind of give a guess if you'll think of me as your friend your pal and if you'll always tell yourself that your pal is going to stand by you no matter what comes why all right he caught his breath she smiled up at him honestly pleased wholly without guile and wholly blind i'd rather have such a friend just now than anything i know except but if your sweetheart should object could you his fingers gripped her shoulders tighter for just a second and he let her go i guess that part'll be all right he rejoined in a tone she could not quite fathom i never had one in my life why you poor thing she stood back and tilted her head at him you poor pal i'll have to see about that immediately every young man wants a sweetheart at least all the young men i ever knew wanted one and and i'll gamble they all wanted the same one he hinted wickedly feeling himself unreasonably happy over something he could not quite put into words even if he had dared oh no hardly ever the same one luckily do you know pal i've quite forgotten what it was all about the unburdening of my soul i mean after all i think i must have been just lonesome the country is just as big but it isn't quite so so empty you see aren't you awfully vain to see how you have peopled it with your friendship she clasped her hands behind her and regarded him speculatively i hope mr cowboy you're in earnest about this she observed doubtfully i hope you have imagination enough to see it isn't silly because if i suspected you weren't playing fair and would go away and laugh at me i'd scratch you she nodded her head slowly at him i've always been told that with tiger eyes you find the disposition of a tiger so if you don't mean it you'd better let me know at once kent brought the color into her cheeks with his steady gaze i was just getting scared you didn't mean it he averred if my pal goes back on me why lord help her she took a slow deep breath how is it you men ratify a solemn agreement she puzzled oh yes with a pretty impulse she held out her right hand half grave half playful shake on it pal kent took her hand and pressed it as hard as he dared you're going to be a dandy little chum he predicted gamely but let me tell you right now if you ever get up on your stilts with me there's going to be all kinds of trouble you call me kent that is he qualified with a little unsteady laugh when there ain't anyone around to get shocked i suppose this isn't quite conventional she conceded as if the thought had just then occurred to her but thank goodness out here there aren't any conventions everyone lives as everyone sees fit it isn't the best thing for some people she added drearily some people have to be bolstered up by convention or they can't help miring in their own weaknesses but we don't and as long as we understand she looked to him for confirmation as long as we understand why it ain't anybody's business but our own he declared steadily she seemed relieved of some lingering doubt 
that's exactly it i don't know why i should deny myself a friend just because that friend happens to be a man and i happen to be married i never did have much patience with the rule that a man must either be perfectly indifferent or else make love i'm so glad you understand so that's all settled she finished briskly and i find that as i said it isn't at all necessary for me to unburden my soul they stood quiet for a moment their thoughts too intangible for speech come inside won't you she invited at last coming back to everyday matters of course you're hungry or you ought to be you daren't run away from my cooking this time mr cowboy manley will be back soon i think i must get some lunch ready kent replied that he would stay outside and smoke so she left him with a fleeting smile infinitely friendly and confiding and glad he turned and looked after her soberly gave a great sigh and reached mechanically for his tobacco and papers thoughtfully rolled a cigarette lighted it and held the match until it burned quite down to his thumb and fingers pals he said just under his breath for the mere sound of the word all right pals it is then he smoked slowly, listening to her moving about in the house. Her steps came nearer. He turned to look. "'What was it you wanted to see Manley about?' she asked him from the doorway. "'I just happened to wonder what it could be.' "'Well, the wishbone needs men, and sent me over to tell him he can go to work. The wagons are going to start tomorrow. He'll want to gather his cattle up, and of course we know about how he's fixed for saddle horses and the like he can work for the outfit and draw wages and get his cattle thrown back on this range and his calves branded besides get paid for doing what he'll have to do anyhow you see i see val pushed back the rebellious lock of hair of course you suggested the idea to the wishbone you're always doing something the outfit is short-handed he reiterated they need him they ain't strainin a point to do man a favor don't you ever think it well he's coming he broke off and started to the gate manley clattered up vociferously glad to greet him kent at his urgent invitation led his horse to the stable and turned him into the corral unsaddled and unbridled him so that he could eat also he told his errand manley interrupted the conversation to produce a bottle of whiskey from a cunningly concealed hole in the depleted haystack and insisted that kent should take a drink kent waved it off and manley drew the cork and held the bottle to his own lips as he stood there with his face uplifted while the yellow liquor gurgled down his throat Kent watched him with a curiously detached interest. So that's how Manley had kept his vow, he was thinking, with an impersonal contempt. Four good swallows. Kent counted them. You're hitting it pretty strong, man, for a fellow that swore off last fall, he commented aloud. Manley took down the bottle, gave a sigh of pure animal satisfaction, and pushed the cork in with an unconsciously regretful movement a fellow's got to get something out of life he defended peevishly i've had pretty hard luck it's enough to drive a fellow to most any kind of relief burnt out last fall cattle scattered and calves running the range all winter i haven't got stock enough to stand that sort of a deal kent no telling where i stand now on the cattle question i did have close to a hundred head and three of my best geldings are missing a poor man can't stand luck like that i'm in debt too and when you've got an iceberg in the house when a man's own wife don't stand by him when he can't get any sympathy from the very one that ought to 
but then i hope i'm a gentleman i don't make any kick against her my domestic affairs are my own affairs sure but when your wife freezes up solid he held the bottle up and looked at it best friend i've got he finished with a whining note in his voice kent turned away disgusted manley had coarsened he had slopped down just when he should have braced up and caught the fighting spirit the spirit that fights and overcomes obstacles with a tightening of his chest he thought of his pal tied for life to this whining drunkard no wonder she felt the need for a friend well are you going out with the wishbone he asked tersely jerking his thoughts back to his errand if you are you'll need to go over there tonight the wagon starts out tomorrow maybe you better ride around by polly's place and have him come over here once in a while to look after things you can't leave your wife alone without somebody to kind of keep an eye out for her you know polycarp ain't going to ride this spring he's got rheumatism or some darned thing but he can chop what wood she'll need and go to town for her once in a while and make sure she's all right you better leave your gentle horse here for her to use too she can't be left afoot out here manley was taking another long swallow from the bottle but he heard why sure i never thought about that i guess maybe i had better get polycarp but val could make out all right alone why she's held it down here for a week at a time last winter when i'd forgot to come home he winked shamelessly or a storm would come up so i couldn't get home val isn't like some fool women i'll say that much for her she don't care whether i'm around or not fact is sometimes i think she's better pleased when i'm gone but you're right i'll see polycarp and have him come over once in a while sure glad you spoke of it you always had a great head for thinking about other people kent you ought to get married no thanks kent scowled i haven't got any grudge against women the world's full of men ready and willing to give em a taste of pure unadulterated hell manley stared at him stupidly and then laughed doubtfully as if he felt certain of having by his dullness missed the point of a very good joke after that the time was filled with the preparations for manley's absence kent did what he could to help and val went calmly about the house packing the few necessary personal belongings which might be stuffed into a war bag and used during round-up beyond an occasional glance of friendly understanding she seemed to have forgotten the compact she had made with kent but when they were ready to ride away kent purposely left his gloves lying upon the couch and remembered them only after manley was in the saddle so he went back and val followed him into the room he wanted to say something he did not quite know what something that would bring them a little closer together and keep them so something that would make her think of him often and kindly he picked up his gloves and held out his hand to her and then a diffidence seized his tongue there was nothing he dared say all the eloquence all the tenderness was in his eyes well good-bye pal be good to yourself he said simply val smiled up at him tremulously good-bye my one friend don't don't get hurt their clasp tightened their hands dropped apart rather limply kent went out and got upon his horse and rode away beside manley and talked of the range and of the round-up and of cattle and a dozen other things which interest men but all the while one exultant thought kept reiterating itself in his mind she never said that much to him she never said that much to him end of chapter 15
Chapter Sixteen of Lonesome Land by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen, Manley's New Tactics. To the east, to the south, to the north went the riders of the Wishbone, gathering the cattle which the fires had driven afar. No rivers stopped them, nor mountains, nor the deep-scarred coulees, nor the plains. It was Manley's first experience in real round-up work. For his own little herd he had managed to keep close at home, and what few strayed afar were turned back, when opportunity afforded, by his neighbors, who wished him well. Now he tasted the pride of ownership to the full, when a VP cow and her calf mingled with the milling wishbones and double diamonds. He was proud of his brand, and proud of the sentiment which had made him choose Val's initials. More than once he explained to his fellows that VP meant Val Payson, and that he had got it recorded just after he and Val were engaged. He was not sentimental about her now, but he liked to dwell upon the fact that he had been. It showed that he was capable of fine feeling. More dominant, however, as the weeks passed and the branding went on, became the desire to accumulate property, cattle. The Wishbone brand went scorching through the hair of hundreds of calves, while the VP scared tens. It was not right. He felt somehow cheated by fate. He mentally figured the increase of his herd, and it seemed to him that it took a long while, much longer than it should, to gain a respectable number in that manner. He cast about in his mind for some rich acquaintance in the East who might be prevailed upon to lend him capital enough to buy, say, five hundred cows. He began to talk about it occasionally when the boys lay around in the evenings. "'You want to ride with a long rope,' suggested Bob Royden, grinning openly at the others. "'That's the way to work up in the cow business. Capital nothing.' You don't get enough excitement buying cattle. You want to steal em. That's what I'd do if I had a brand of my own, and all your ambition to get rich. And get sent up, Manley rounded out the situation. No thanks, he laughed. It's a better way to get to the pen than it is to get rich, from all accounts. Sandy Moran remembered a fellow who worked a brand and kept it up for seven or eight years before they caught him, and he recounted the tale between puffs at his cigarette. Only they didn't catch him, he finished. A puncher put him wise to what was in the wind, and he sold out cheap to a tenderfoot and pulled his freight. They never did locate him. Then with a pointed rock, which he picked up beside him, he drew a rude diagram or two in the dirt, that's how he done it, he explained. Pretty smooth, too. So the talk went on, as such things will, idly, without purpose, save to pass the time. Shop talk of the range it was. Tales of stealing, of working brands, and of branding unmarked yearlings at weaning time. Of this big cattleman and that, who practically stole whole herds and thereby took long strides toward wealth. Range scandals grown old, range gossip, all of it, of men who had changed a brand or made one, using a cinch ring at a tiny fire in a secluded hollow, or a spur, or a jackknife, who were caught in the act, after the act, or merely suspected of the crime, of sweat brands, blotched brands, brands added to and altered, of trials, of shootings, of hangings even, and getaways, spectacular and humorous and pathetic. Manley, being in a measure a pilgrim, and having no experience to draw upon, and not much imagination, took no part in the talk, except that he listened and was intensely interested. Two months of mingling with men who talked little else had its influence. That fall, when Manley had his hay up and his cattle once more ranging close toward the river, and in the broken country bounded upon the west by the fenced-in railroad, three calves bore the VP brand. 
three husky heifers that never had suckled a VP mother. So had the range gossip, sown by chance in the soil of his greed of gain and his weakening moral fiber, borne fruit. The deed scared him sober for a month. For a month his color changed, and his blood quickened whenever a horseman showed upon the rim of Cold Spring Cooley. For a month he never left the ranch, unless business compelled him to do so, and his return was speedy, his eyes anxious until he knew that all was well. After that his confidence returned. He grew more secretive, more self-assured, more at ease with his guilt. He looked the wishbone men squarely in the eye, and it seldom occurred to him that he was a thief, or if it did, the word was but a synonym for luck, with shrewdness behind. Sometimes he regretted his timidity. Why three calves only? In a deep little coulee next the river, a coulee which the roundup had missed, had been more than three. He might have doubled the number and risked no more than for the three. The longer he dwelt upon that, the more inclined he was to feel that he had cheated himself. That fall there were no fires. It would be long before men grew careless when the grass was ripened and the winds blew hot and dry from out the west. The big prairie which lay high between the river and Hope was dotted with feeding cattle. Wishbones and double diamonds mostly, with here and there a stray. Manley grew wily and began to plan far in advance. He rode here and there, quietly keeping his own cattle well down toward the river. There was shelter there and feed, and the idea was a good one. Just before the river broke up, he saw to it that a few of his own cattle, and with them some wishbone cows and a steer or two, were ranging in a deep bushy coulee, isolated and easily passed by. He had driven them there and he left them there. That spring he worked again with the wishbone. When the roundup swept the home range, gathering and branding, it chanced that his part of the circle took him and Sandy Moran down that way. It was hot, and they had thirty or forty head of cattle before them when they neared that particular place. "'No need going down into the brakes here,' he told Sandy easily. I've been hazing out everything I came across lately. They were mostly my own, anyway. I believe I've got it pretty well cleaned up along here." Sandy was not the man to hunt hard riding. He went to the rim of the coulee and looked down for a minute. He saw nothing moving, and took Manley's word for it with no stirring of his easy-going conscience. He said all right and rode on. End of chapter 16。Chapter 17 of Lonesome Land by B. M. Bower。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Chapter 17 。Val becomes an author。Quite as marked had been the change in Val that year. Every time Kent saw her, he recognized the fact that she was a little different, a little less superior in her attitude, a little more independent in her views of life. Her standards seemed slowly changing, and her way of thinking. He did not see her often, but when he did, the mockery of their friendship struck him more keenly, his inward rebellion against circumstances grew more bitter. He wondered how she could be so blind as to think they were just pals and no more. She did think so. All the little confidences, all the glances, all the smiles she gave and received frankly in the name of friendship. "'You know, Kent, this is my ideal of how people should be,' she told him once, with a perfectly honest enthusiasm. "'I've always dreamed of such a friendship.' and I've always believed that some day the right man would come along and make it possible. Not one in a thousand could understand and meet one halfway. 
"'They'd be liable to go farther,' Kent assented dryly. "'Yes, that's just the trouble. They'd spoil an ideal friendship by falling in love.' "'Darn chumps,' Kent classed them sweepingly. "'Exactly. Pal, your vocabulary excites my envy. It's so forcible sometimes.' Kent grinned reminiscently. "'It sure is, old girl.' Oh, I don't mean necessarily profane. I wonder what your vocabulary will do to the secret I'm going to tell you." The sweet peas had reached the desired height and profusion of blossoms, thanks to the pails and pails of water Val had carried and lavished upon them, and she was gathering a handful of the prettiest blooms for him. Her cheeks turned a bit pinker as she spoke and her hesitation raised a wild hope briefly in Kent's heart. "'What is it?' he had to force the words out. "'I—I I hate to tell, but I want you to—to to help me.' "'Well?' To Kent, at that moment, she was not Manley's wife. She was not any man's wife. She was the girl he loved loved with the primitive absorbing passion of the man who lives naturally and does not borrow his morals from his next-door neighbor his code of ethics was his own thought out by himself val hated her husband and her husband did not seem to care much for her they were tied together legally and a mere legality could not hold back the emotions and the desires of kent burnett with him it was not a question of morals. It was a question of Val's feeling in the matter. Val looked up at him, found something strange in his eyes, and immediately looked away again. "'Your eyes are always saying things I can't hear,' she observed irrelevantly. "'Are they? Do you want me to act as interpreter?' "'No, I just want you to listen.' "'Have you noticed anything different about me lately, Kent?' She tilted her head while she passed judgment upon a cluster of speckled blossoms, odd but not particularly pretty. "'What do you mean, anyway? I'm liable to get off wrong if I tell you.' "'Oh, you're so horribly cautious. Have I seemed any more content, any happier lately?' Kent picked a spray of flowers and pulled them ruthlessly to pieces. "'Maybe I've kind of hoped so,' he said, almost in a whisper. "'Well, I've a new interest in life. I just discovered it by accident, almost.' Kent lifted his head and looked keenly at her, and his face was a lighter shade of brown than it had been. "'It seems to change everything.' "'Pal, I... I've been writing things.' Kent discovered he had been holding his breath and let it go in a long sigh. "'Oh!' After a minute he smiled philosophically. "'What kind of things?' he drawled. "'Well, verses, but mostly stories. You see,' she explained impulsively, "'I want to earn some money, of my own. I haven't said much, because I hate whining, but really things are growing pretty bad between Manley and me. I hope it isn't my fault. I have tried every way I know to keep my faith in him and to, to help him, but he's not the same as he was. You know that. And I have a good deal of pride. I can't, oh, it's intolerable having to ask a man for money, especially when he doesn't want to give you any she added naively. At first it wasn't necessary. I had a little of my own, and all my things were new. But one must eventually buy things, for the house, you know, and for one's personal needs. And he seems to resent it dreadfully. I never would have believed that Manley could be stingy, actually stingy. But he is, unfortunately. I hate to speak of his faults, even to you but I've got to be honest with you. It isn't nice to say that I'm writing, not for any particularly burning desire to express my thoughts, not for the sentiment of it, but to earn money. 
It's terribly sordid, isn't it? She smiled wistfully up at him. But there seems to be money in it for those who succeed, and it's a work that I can do here. I have oceans of time, and I'm not disturbed. Her lips curved into bitter lines. I do so much thinking. I might as well put my brain to some use. With one of her sudden changes of mood, she turned to Kent and clasped both hands upon his arm. "'Now you see, pal, how much our friendship means to me,' she said softly. "'I couldn't have told this to another living soul. It seems awfully treacherous, saying it even to you. I mean, about him. But you're so good. You always understand, don't you, pal?' "'I guess so.' Kent forced the words out naturally, and kept his breath even, and his arms from clasping her. He considered that he performed quite a feat of endurance. "'You're modest,' she gave his arm a little shake. "'Of course you do. You know I'm not treacherous, really. You know I'd do anything I could for him. But this is something that doesn't concern him at all. He doesn't know it, but that is because he would only sneer.' When I have really sold something and received the money for it, then it won't matter to me who knows. But now it's a solemn secret just between me and my pal." Her yellow-brown eyes dwelt upon his face. Kent, stealing a glance at her from under his drooped lids, wondered if she had ever given any time to analyzing herself. He would have given much to know if, down deep in her heart, she really believed in this pal business, if she was really a friend and no more. She puzzled him a good deal sometimes. "'Well, if anybody can make good at that business, you sure ought to. You've got brains enough to write a dictionary.' He permitted himself the indulgence of saying that much, and he was perfectly sincere. He honestly considered Val the cleverest woman in the world." She laughed with gratification. "'Your sublime confidence, while it is undoubtedly mistaken, is nevertheless appreciated,' she told him primly, moving away with her hands full of flowers. "'If you've got the nerve, come inside and read some of my stuff. I want to know if it's any good at all.' Presently he was seated upon the couch in the little, pathetically bright front room and he was knitting his eyebrows over Val's beautifully regular handwriting, pages and pages of it, so that there seemed to be no end to the task, and was trying to give his mind to what he was reading instead of to the author, sitting near him with her hands folded demurely on her lap, and her eyes fixed expectantly upon his face, trying to read his decision even as it was forming. Some verses she had tried on him first, Kent, by using all his determination of character, read them all, every word of them. "'That's sure all right,' he said, though, beyond a telling phrase or two, one line in particular which would stick in his memory. "'Men live and love and die in that lonely land.' He had no very clear idea of what it was all about. Certain lines seemed to go bumping along and then one had to mispronounce some of the final words to make them rhyme with the others gone before. But it was all right. Val wrote it. "'I think I do better at stories,' she ventured modestly. "'I wrote one, a little story about university life, and sent it to a magazine. They wrote a lovely letter about it, but it seems that field is overdone or something. The editor asked me why, living out here in the very heart of the West, I don't try Western stories. I think I shall, and that's why I said I should need your help. I thought we might work together, you know. You've lived here so long, and ought to have some splendid ideas, things that have happened or that you've heard, and you could tell me and I'd write them up. Wouldn't you like to collaborate, go in cahoots on it? Sure. Kent regarded her thoughtfully. 
she really was looking brighter and happier and her enthusiasm was not to be mistaken her world had changed anything i can do to help you know of course i know i think it's perfectly splendid don't you we'll divide the money when there is any and will we his tone was noncommittal in the extreme of course now don't let's quarrel about that till we come to it i have a good idea of my own i think for the first story a man comes out here and disappears you know and after a while his sister comes to find him she gets into all kinds of trouble is kidnapped by a gang of robbers and kept in a cave when the leader of the gang comes back he has been away on some depredation you see i have only the bare outline of the story yet and well it's her brother he kills the one who kidnapped her and she reforms him of course there ought to be some love interest i think perhaps one member of the gang ought to fall in love with her don't you know and after a while he wins her she'll reform him too i reckon oh yes she couldn't love a man she couldn't respect no woman could oh kent took a minute to apply that personally it was of value to him because it was an indication of val's own code maybe he suggested tentatively she'd get busy and reform the whole bunch oh say that would be great she's an awfully sweet little thing perfectly lovely you know and they'd all be in love with her so it wouldn't be improbable don't you remember kent you told me once that a man would do anything for a woman if he cared enough for her sure he would too kent fought back a momentary temptation to prove the truth of it by his own acquiescence in this pal business he was saved from disaster by a suspicion that val would not be able to see it from his point of view and by the fact that he would much rather be pals than nothing she would have gone on talking and planning and discussing indefinitely but the sun slid lower and lower and kent was not his own master the time came when he had to go regardless of his own wishes or hers when he came again the story was finished and val was waiting with extreme impatience to read it to him and hear his opinion before she sent it away kent was not so impatient to hear it but he did not tell her so he had not seen her for a month and he wanted to talk not about anything in particular just talk about little things and see her eyes light up once in a while and her lips purse primly when he said something daring and maybe have her play something on the violin while he smoked and watched her slim wrist bend and rise and fall with the movement of the bow he could imagine no single thing more fascinating than that that and the way she cuddled the violin under her chin in the hollow of her neck but val would not play she had been too busy to practice all spring and summer she scarcely ever touched the violin she said and she did not want to talk or if she did it was plain that she had only one theme so kent perforce listened to the story afterward he assured her that it was out of sight as a matter of fact half the time he had not heard a word of what she was reading he had been too busy just looking at her and being glad he was there he had however a dim impression that it was a story with people in it whom one does not try to imagine as ever being alive and with a west which beyond its evident scarcity of inhabitants was not the west he knew anything about one paragraph of description had caught his attention because it seemed a fairly accurate picture of the bench land which surrounded cold spring coulee but it had not seemed to have anything to do with the story itself of course it must be good val wrote it he began to admire her intensity 
quite apart from his own personal subjugation. Val was pleased with his praise. For two solid hours she talked of nothing but that story, and she gave him some fresh chocolate cake and a pitcher of lemonade, and urged him to come again in about three weeks, when she expected to hear from the magazine she thought would be glad to take the story, the one whose editor had suggested that she write of the West. In the fall and in the winter their discussions were frequently hampered by Manley's presence. But Val's enthusiasm, though nipped here and there by unappreciative editors, managed somehow to live, or perhaps it had developed into a dogged determination to succeed in spite of everything. She still wrote things, and she still read them to Kent when there was time and opportunity. Sometimes he was bold enough to criticize the worst places, and to tell her how she might, in his opinion, remedy them. Occasionally Val would take his advice. So the months passed. The winds blew and brought storm and heat and sunshine and cloud. Nothing in that big land appreciably changed, except the people, and they so imperceptibly that they failed to realize it until afterward. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of Lonesome Land by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 Val's Discovery. With a blood red sun at his back and a rosy tinge upon all the hills before him, Manley rode slowly down the western rim of Cold Spring Coulee, driving five rebellious calves that had escaped the branding iron in the spring. Though they were not easily driven in any given direction, he was singularly patient with them, and refrained from bellowing epithets and admonitions, as might have been expected. When he was almost down the hill, he saw Val standing in the kitchen door, shading her eyes with her hands that she might watch his approach. "'Open the corral gate!' he shouted to her in the tone of command and stand back where you can head em off if they start up the coulee val replied by doing as she was told she was not in the habit of wasting words upon manley they seemed always to precipitate an unpleasant discussion of some sort as if he took it for granted she disapproved of all he did or said and was always upon the defensive the calves came on lumbering awkwardly in a half-hearted gallop as if they had very little energy left. Their tongues protruded, their mouths dribbled a lathery foam, and their rough, sweaty hides told Val of the long chase. For she was wiser in the ways of the rangeland than she had been. She stood back, gently waving her ruffled white apron at them, and when they dodged into the corral, rolling eyes at her, she ran up and slammed the gate shut upon them, looped the chain around the post, and dropped the iron hook into a link to fasten it. Manley galloped up, threw himself off his parting horse, and began to unsaddle. "'Get some wood, and start a fire, and put the iron in, Val,' he told her brusquely. Val looked at him quickly. "'Now? Supper's all ready, Manley. There's no hurry about branding them, is there?' and she added, "'Dear me! The roundup must have just skimmed the top off this range last spring. You've had to brand a lot of calves that were missed.' "'What the devil is it to you?' he demanded roughly. "'I want that fire, madam, and I want it now. I rather think I knew when I want a brand without asking your advice.' Val curved her lips scornfully shrugged and obeyed. She was used to that sort of thing, and she did not mind very much. He had brutalized by degrees, and by degrees she had hardened. He could rouse no feeling now but contempt. "'If you'll kindly wait until I put back the supper,' she said coldly, 
"'I suppose in your zeal one need not sacrifice your food. "'You're still rather particular about that, I observe.' "'Manley was leading his horse to the stable, "'and though he answered something, "'the words were no more than a surly mumble. "'He's been drinking again,' Val decided dispassionately, on the way to the house. I suppose he carried a bottle in his pocket and emptied it. She was not long. There was a penalty of profane reproach attached to delay, however slight, when Manley was in that mood. She had the fire going and the VP iron heating by the time he had stabled and fed his horse and had driven the calves into the smaller pen. He drove a big, line-backed heifer into a corner, roped and tied her down with surprising dexterity, and turned impatiently. "'Come! Isn't that iron ready yet?' Val, on the other side of the fence, drew it out and inspected it indifferently. "'It is not, Mr. Fleetwood. If you are in a very great hurry, why not apply your temper to it, and a few choice remarks?' oh don't try to be sarcastic it's too pathetic kick a little life into that fire yes sir thank you sir val could be rather exasperating when she chose she always could be sure of making manley silently furious when she adopted that tone of respectful servility as employed by butlers and footmen upon the stage her mimicry be it said was very good here it is sir thank you sir hope i haven't kept you waiting sir she announced after he had fumed for two minutes inside the corral and she had cynically hummed her way quite through the hymn which begins blessed be the tie that binds she passed the white-hot iron deftly through the rails to him and fixed the fire for another heating Really, she was not thinking of Manley at all, nor of his mood, nor of his brutal coarseness. She was thinking of the rebuilt typewriter, advertised as being exactly as good as a new one, and scandalously cheap, for which she had sold her watch to Arlene Hawley to get money to buy. She was counting mentally the days since she had sent the money order, and was thinking it should come that week, surely. She was also planning to seize upon the opportunity afforded by Manley's next absence for a day from the ranch, and drive to Hope on the chance of getting the machine. Only, she wished she could be sure whether Kent would be coming soon. She did not want to miss seeing him. She decided to sound Polycarp Jenks the next time he came. Polycarp would know, of course, whether the Wishbone outfit was in from Roundup, Polycarp always knew everything that had been done, or was intended, among the neighbors. Manley passed the ill-smelling iron back to her, and she put it in the fire, quite mechanically. It was not the first time, nor the second, that she had been called upon to help Brand. She could heat an iron as quickly and evenly as most men, though Manley had never troubled to tell her so. Five times she heated the iron, and heard, with an inward quiver of pity and disgust, the spasmodic blat of the calf in the pen when the VP went searing into the hide on its ribs. She did not see why they must be branded that evening in particular, but it was as well to have it done with. Also, if Manley meant to wean them, she would have to see that they were fed and watered, she supposed that would make her trip to town a hurried one if she went at all she would have to go and come the same day and arline hawley would scold and beg her to stay and call her a fool now how about that supper asked manley when they were through and the air was clearing a little from the smoke and the smell of burned hair i really don't know i smelled the potatoes burning some time ago I'll see, however. She brushed her hands with her handkerchief, pushed back the lock of hair that was always falling across her temple, and because she was really offended by Manley's attitude and tone, she sang softly all the way to the house, 
merely to conceal from him the fact that he could move her even to irritation. Her best weapon, she had discovered long ago, was absolute indifference, the indifference which overlooked his presence and was deaf to his recriminations. She completed her preparations for his supper, made sure that nothing was lacking and that the tea was just right, placed his chair in position, filled the water glass beside his plate, set the teapot where he could reach it handily, and went into the living room and closed the door between. In the past year, filled as it had been with her literary ambitions and endeavors, she had neglected her music. But she took her violin from the box, hunted the cake of resin, tuned the strings, and when she heard him come into the kitchen and sit down at the table, seated herself upon the front doorstep and began to play. There was one bit of music which Manley thoroughly detested. That was the Traumerei. Therefore she played the Traumerei slowly, as it should, of course, be played, with full value given to all the pensive, long-drawn notes, and with a finale positively creepy in its dreamy wistfulness. Val, as has been stated, could be very exasperating when she chose. In the kitchen there was the subdued rattle of dishes, unbroken and unhurried. Val went on playing, but she forgot that she had begun in a half-conscious desire to annoy her husband. She stared dreamily at the hill which shut out the world to the east, and yielded to a mood of loneliness, of longing in the abstract, for all the pleasant things she was missing in this life which she had chosen in her ignorance. When Manley flung open the inner door, she gave a stifled exclamation. She had forgotten all about Manley. "'By all the big and little gods of Greece,' he swore angrily, "'calves bawling their heads off in the corral, and you squalling that whiny stuff you call music in the house.' home sure a hell of a happy place. I'm going to town. You don't want to leave the place till I come back. I want those calves looked after. He seemed to consider something mentally, and then added, If I'm not back before they quit bawling, you can turn em down in the river field with the rest. You know when they're weaned and ready to settle down. Don't feed em too much hay, like you did that other bunch. Just give them what they need. You don't have to pile the corral full. And don't keep them shut up an hour longer than necessary. Val nodded her head to show that she heard and went on playing. There was seldom any pretense of good feeling between them now. She tuned the violin to minor and poised the bow over the strings, in some doubt as to her memory of a serenade she wanted to try next. "'Shall I have Polycarp take the team and haul up some wood from the river?' she asked carelessly. "'We're nearly out again.' "'Oh, I don't care. If he happens along.' He turned and went out, his mind turning eagerly to the town and what it could give him in the way of pleasure. Val, still sitting in the doorway, saw him ride away up the grade and disappear over the brow of the hill. The dusk was settling softly upon the land, so that his figure was but a vague shape. She was alone again. She rather liked being alone, now that she had no longer a blind, unreasoning terror of the empty land. She had her thoughts and her work. The presence of Manley was merely an unpleasant interruption to both. Sometime in the night she heard the lowing of a cow somewhere near. She wondered dreamily what it could be doing in the coulee, and went to sleep again. The five calves were all bawling in a chorus of complaint against their forced separation from their mothers, and the deeper throaty tones of the cow mingled not inharmoniously with the sound. Range cattle were not permitted in the coulee, and when by chance they found a broken panel in the fence and strayed down there, Val drove them out a foot usually, 
with shouts and badly aimed stones to accelerate their lumbering pace. After she had eaten her breakfast in the morning, she went out to investigate. Beyond the corral, her nose thrust close against the rails, a cow was bawling dismally. Inside, in much the same position, its tail waving a violent signal of its owner's distress, a calf was clamoring hysterically for its mother and its mother's milk. Val sympathized with them both, but the cow did not belong in the coulee, and she gathered two or three small stones and went around where she could frighten her away from the fence without, however, exposing herself too recklessly to her uncertain temper. Cows at weaning time did sometimes object to being driven from their calves. "'Shoo! Go on away from there!' Val raised a stone and poised it threateningly. The cow turned and regarded her, wild-eyed. It backed a step or two, evidently uncertain of its next move. "'Go on away!' Val was just on the point of throwing the rock when she dropped it unheeded to the ground and stared. "'Why, you—you—' you, "'Why, the idea!' She turned slowly white. Certain things must filter to the understanding through amazement and disbelief. It took Val a minute or two to grasp the significance of what she saw. By the time she did grasp it, her knees were bending weakly beneath the weight of her body. She put out a groping hand and caught the corner of the corral to keep herself from falling. And she stared and stared. "'It's, oh, surely not,' she whispered, protesting against her understanding. She gave a little sob that had no immediate relation to tears. "'Surely, surely not!' It was of no use. Understanding came and came clearly, pitilessly. Many things, trifles all of them, to which she had given no thought at the time, or which she had forgotten immediately, came back to her of their own accord, things she tried not to remember. The cow stared at her for a minute, and when she made no hostile move, turned its attention back to its bereavement. Once again it thrust its moist muzzle between two rails, gave a preliminary vibrant mmm, mmm, and then with a spasmodic heaving of ribs and of flank, burst into a long-drawn haw-haw, which rose rapidly in a tremulous crescendo and died to a throaty rumbling. Val started nervously though her eyes were fixed upon the cow, and she knew the sound was coming. It served, however, to release her from the spell of horror which had gripped her. She was still white, and when she moved she felt intolerably heavy, so that her feet dragged. But she was no longer dazed. She went slowly around to the gate, reached up wearily and undid the chain fastening, opened the gate slightly, and went in. Four of the calves were huddled together for mutual comfort in a corner. They were blatting indefatigably. Val went over to where the fifth one still stood beside the fence, as near the cow as it could get, and threw a small stone that bounced off the calf's rump. The calf jumped and ran aimlessly before her until it reached the half-open gate, when it dodged out, as if it could scarcely believe its own good fortune. Before Val could follow it outside, it was nuzzling rapturously its mother, and the cow was comforting her body so that she could caress her offspring with her tongue while she rumbled her satisfaction. Val closed and fastened the gate carefully and went back to where the cow still lingered. With her lips drawn to a thin, colorless line, she drove her across the coulee and up the hill, the calf gambling close alongside. When they had gone out of sight, up on the level, Val turned back and went slowly to the house. 
she stood for a minute staring stupidly at it and at the coulee went in and gazed around her with that blankness which follows a great mental shock after a minute she shivered threw up her hands before her face and dropped a pitiful sorrowing heap of quivering rebellion upon the couch End of chapter 18chapter 19 of lonesome land by b m bower this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 19 kent's confession polycarp jenks came ambling into the coulee rapped perfunctorily upon the door casing and entered the kitchen as one who feels perfectly at home and sure of his welcome as was not unfitting considering the fact that he had chored around for Val during the last year and longer. "'Anybody to home?' he called, seeing the front door shut tight. There was a stir within, and Val, still pale and with an almost furtive expression in her eyes, opened the door and looked out. "'Oh, it's you, Polycarp,' she said lifelessly. "'Is there anything—' "'What's the matter? Sick?' You look kind of peaked and frazzled out. I met Man last night, and he told me you needed wood. I thought I'd ride over and see. By Granny, you do look bad. Just a headache, Val evaded, shrinking back guiltily. Just do whatever there is to do, Polycarp. I think, I don't believe the chickens have had anything to eat today. Them headaches are sure a fright. They're might nigh as bad as rheumatism when they hit you hard. You just go back and lay down, and I'll look around and see what they is to do. Any idea when man's coming back? No. Val brought the word out with an involuntary sharpness. No, I reckon not. I hear him and Fred de Garmo come might near having a fight last night. Blumenthal was telling me this morning. Fred's quit the double diamond, I hear. He's got himself appointed deputy stock inspector, and how he managed to get the job is more than I can figure out. They say he's all swelled up over it. Got his headquarters in town, you know, and seems he got to lording it over a man last night, and I guess if somebody hadn't stopped him, there'd have been a mix-up, all right. Man wasn't in no shape to fight. He'd been drinking pretty... Yes, well, just do whatever there is to do, Polycarp. The horses are in the upper pasture, I think, if you want to haul wood. She closed the door, gently, but with exceeding firmness, and Polycarp took the hint. Women is queer, he muttered as he left the house. Now, she knows man drinks like a fish, and she knows everybody else knows it. But if you so much as mention such a thing, why— He waggled his head disapprovingly and proceeded, in his habitually laborious manner, to take a chew of tobacco. No matter how much they may know a thing is so, if it don't suit em, you can't never get em to stand right up and face it out. Seems like, by granny, it comes natural to em to make believe things is different. Now, she knows might well she can't fool me. I've heard man swear at her like— He reached the corral, and his insatiable curiosity turned his thoughts into a different channel. He inspected the four calves gravely, wondered audibly where man had found them, and how the roundup came to miss them, and criticized his application of the brand. In the opinion of Polycarp, Manley either burned too deep or not deep enough. "'Time that line-backed heifer scabs off. You can't tell what's on her,' he asserted, expectorating solemnly before he turned away to his work. From a window, Val watched him with cold terror. Would he suspect? Or was there anything to suspect? "'It's silly. It's perfectly idiotic,' she told herself impatiently. But if he hangs around that corral another minute, I shall scream. 
she watched until she saw him mount his horse and ride off toward the upper pasture. Then she went out and began apathetically picking seed pods off her sweet peas, which the early frosts had spared. "'Head better?' called Polycarp half an hour later, when he went rattling past the house with a wagon bound for the river bottom where they got their supply of wood. "'A little,' Val answered inattentively, without looking at him. It was while Polycarp was after the wood, and while she was sitting upon the edge of the porch, listlessly arranging and rearranging a handful of long-stemmed blossoms, that Kent galloped down the hill and up to the gate. She saw him coming, and set her teeth hard together. She did not want to see Kent just then. She did not want to see anybody. Kent, however, wanted to see her. It seemed to him at least a month since he had had a glimpse of her, though it was no more than half that time. He watched her covertly while he came up the path. His mind, all the way over from the wishbone, had been very clear and very decided. He had a certain thing to tell her, and a certain thing to do. He had thought it all out during the nights when he could not sleep, and the days when men called him surly and there was no going back, no reconsideration of the matter. He had been telling himself that, over and over, ever since the house came into view and he saw her sitting there on the porch. She would probably want to argue, and perhaps she would try to persuade him, but it would be absolutely useless, absolutely. "'Well, hello!' he cried, with more than his usual buoyancy of manner because he knew he must hurt her later on. "'Hello, Madam Authoress. Why this haughty air, this stuck-uppedness? Shall I get a ladder and climb up where you can hear me say howdy?' He took off his hat and slapped her gently upon the top of her head with it. "'Come out of the fog!' "'Oh, I wish you wouldn't.' She glanced up at him so briefly that he caught only a flicker of her yellow-brown eyes, and went on fumbling her flowers. Kent stood and looked down at her for a moment. "'Mad?' he inquired cheerfully. "'Say, you look awfully savage. On the dead you do. What do you care if they sent it back? You had all the fun of writing it, and you know it's a dandy. Please smile, pretty please,' he wheedled. It was not the first time he had discovered her in a despondent mood, nor the first time he had bantered and badgered her out of her gloom. Presently it dawned upon him that this was more serious. He had never seen her quite so colorless or so completely without spirit. "'Sick, pal?' he asked gently, sitting down beside her. "'No, I suppose not.' Val bit her lips as soon as she had spoken to check their quivering. "'Well, what is it? I wish you'd tell me. I came over here full of something I had to tell you, but I can't now, not while you're like this.' He watched her yearningly. "'Oh, I can't tell you. It's nothing.' Val jerked a sweet pea viciously from its stem, pressed her hand against her mouth, and turned reluctantly toward him. "'What was it you came to tell me?' He watched her narrowly. "'I'll gamble you're down in the mouth about something hubby has said or done. You needn't tell me, but I just want to ask you if you'd think it's worth while. You needn't tell me that, either. You know blamed well it ain't. He can't deal you any more misery than you let him hand out. You want to keep that in mind.' Another blossom was demolished. "'What was it you came to tell me?' she repeated steadily, though she did not look at him. "'Oh, nothing much. I'm going to leave the country, is all.' "'Kent!' After a minute she forced another word out. "'Why?' Kent regarded her somberly. "'You better think twice before you ask me that,' he warned because I ain't much good at beating all around the bush. If you ask me again, I'll tell you, and I'm liable to tell you without any frills. 
he drew a hard breath. "'So I'd advise you not to ask,' he finished half-challengingly. Val placed a pale lavender blossom against a creamy white one and held the two up for inspection. "'When are you going?' she asked evenly. "'I don't know exactly. In a day or so. Saturday, maybe.' She hesitated over the flowers in her lap and selected a pink one, which she tried with the white and the lavender. "'And why are you going?' she asked him deliberately. Kent stared at her fixedly. A faint pink flush was creeping into her cheeks. He watched it deepen, and knew that his silence was filling her with uneasiness. He wondered how much she guessed of what he was going to say, and how much it would mean to her. "'All right, I'll tell you why, fast enough,' his tone was grim. "'I'm going to leave the country because I can't stay any longer, not while you're in it. "'Why, Kent!' she seemed inexpressibly shocked. "'I don't know,' he went on relentlessly, "'what you think a man's made of, anyhow, "'and I don't know what you think of this pal business. "'I know what I think. "'It's a mighty good way to drive a man crazy. "'I've had about all of it I can stand, if you want to know.' "'I'm sorry if you don't, if you can't be friends any longer,' she said, and he winced to see how her eyes filled with tears. "'But, of course, if you can't, if it bores you—' Kent seized her arm, a bit roughly. "'Have I got to come right out and tell you, in plain English, that I—that it's because I'm so deep in love with you I can't? If you only knew what it's cost me this last year—' to play the game and not play it too hard? What do you think a man's made of? Do you think a man can care for a woman like I care for you? And do you think he wants to be just pals and stand back and watch some drunken brute abuse her and never hear? His voice grew testier. Don't do that. Don't. I didn't want to hurt you. God knows I didn't want to hurt you. He threw his arm around her shoulders and pulled her toward him. "'Don't, pal, I'm a brute, I guess, like all the rest of the male humans. I don't mean to be—it's the way I'm made. When a woman means so much to me that I can't think of anything else, day or night, and get to counting days and scheming to see her, why, being friends, like we've been— is like giving a man a teaspoon of milk and water when he's starving to death, and thinking that ought to do. But I shouldn't have let it hurt you. I tried to stand for it, little woman. There were times when I just had to fight myself not to take you up in my arms and carry you off and keep you. You must admit, he argued, smiling rather wanly, that, considering how I felt about it, I've done pretty tolerable well up till now. You don't, you never will know how much it's cost. Why, my nerves are getting so raw I can't stand anything any more. That's why I'm going. I don't want to hang around till I do something foolish. He took his arm away from her shoulders and moved farther off. He was not sure how far he might trust himself. "'If I thought you cared, or if there was anything I could do for you,' he ventured after a moment, "'why, it would be different, but—' Val lifted her head and turned to him. "'There is something, or there was, or—oh, I can't think any more. "'I suppose, doubtfully, if you feel as if you say you do, why, it would be wicked to stay. "'But you don't. You must just imagine it. Oh, all right, Kent interpolated ironically. But if you go away... She got up and stood before him, breathing unevenly, in little gasps. Oh, you mustn't go away. Please don't go. There's something terrible happened. Oh, Kent, I need you. I can't tell you what it is. It's the most horrible thing I ever heard of. You can't imagine anything more horrible, Kent. 
she twisted her fingers together nervously and the blossoms dropped one by one on the ground if you go she pleaded i won't have a friend in the country not a real friend and and i never needed a friend as much as i do now and you mustn't go i i can't let you go it was like her hysterical fear of being left alone after the fire kent eyed her keenly he knew there must have been something to put her into this state something more than his own rebellion he felt suddenly ashamed of his weakness in giving way in telling her how it was with him the faint far-off chuckle of a wagon came to his ears he turned impatiently toward the sound polycarp was driving up the coulee with a load of wood already he was nearing the gate which opened into the lower field kent stood up reached out and caught val by the hand come on into the house he said peremptorily polly's coming and you don't want him goggling and listening and i want you he added when he had led her inside and closed the door to tell me what all this is about there's something and i want to know what if it concerns you then it concerns me a whole lot too and what concerns me i'm going to find out about what is it val sat down got up immediately and crossed the room aimlessly to sit in another chair she pressed her palms tightly against both cheeks drew in her breath as if she were going to speak and after all said nothing she looked out of the window, pushing back the errant strand of hair. "'I can't. I don't know how to tell you,' she began desperately. "'It's too horrible.' "'Maybe it is. I don't know what you'd call too horrible. I kind of think it wouldn't be what I'd tack those words to. Anyway, what is it?' He went close, and he spoke insistently. She took a long breath manley's a thief she jerked the words out like an automaton they were not evidently the words she had meant to speak for she seemed frightened afterward oh that's it kent made a sound which was not far from a snort well what about it what's he done how did you find it out val straightened in the chair and gazed up at him once more her tawny eyes gave him a certain shock as if he had never before noticed them after all our neighbors have done for him she cried bitterly after giving him hay when his was burned and he couldn't buy any after building stables and corral and everything they did the kindest best neighbors a man ever had oh it's too shameful for utterance I might forgive it, I might only for that. The, the ingratitude, it's too despicable, too... Kent laid a steadying hand upon her arm. Yes, but what is it? he interrupted. Val shook off his hand unconsciously, impatient of any touch. Oh, the bare deed itself, well, it's rather petty, too, and cheap. Her voice became full of contempt. It was the calves. He brought home five last night, five that hadn't been branded last spring. Where he find them, I don't know. I didn't care enough about her to ask. He had been drinking, I think. I can usually tell, and he often carries a bottle in his pocket, as I happen to know. Well, he had made a fire and heat the iron for him, and he branded them, last night. He was very touchy about it when I asked him what was his hurry. I think now it was a stupid thing for him to do. And, well, in the night, sometime, I heard a cow bawling around close, and this morning I went out to drive her away. The fence is always down somewhere. I suppose she found a place to get through, so I went out to drive her away. Her eyes dropped, as if she were making a confession of her own misdeed. She clenched her hands tightly in her lap. 
Well, it was a wishbone cow. After all, she said it very quietly. The devil it was! Kent had been prepared for something of the sort, but nevertheless he started when he heard his own outfit mentioned. Yes, it was a wishbone cow. Her voice was flat and monotonous. He had stolen her calf. He had it in the corral, and he had branded it with his own brand, with a VP, with my initials, she wailed suddenly, as if the thought had just struck her, and was intolerably bitter. She had followed, had been hunting her calf. It was rather a little calf, smaller than the others, and it was crowded up against the fence, trying to get to her. There was no mistaking their relationship. I tried to think he had made a mistake, but it's of no use. I know he didn't. I know he stole that calf, and for all I know the others, too. Oh, it's perfectly horrible to think of. Kent could easily guess her horror of it, and he was sorry for her, but his mind turned instantly to the practical side of it. "'Well, maybe it can be fixed up, if you feel so bad about it. Does Polycarp, did he see the cow hanging around?' Val shook her head apathetically. "'No, he didn't come till just a little while ago. That was this morning, and I drove her out of the coulee, her and her calf. They went up over the hill.' Kent stood looking down at her rather stupidly. "'You what? What was it you did?' It seemed to him that something, some vital point of the story, had eluded him. "'I drove them away. I didn't think they ought to be permitted to hang around here.' Her lips quivered again. "'I, I didn't want to see him get into any trouble.' "'You drove them away? Both of them?' Kent was frowning at her now. Val sprang up and faced him, all a tremble with indignation. Certainly, both. I'm not a thief, Kent Burnett. When I knew, when there was no possible doubt, why, what, in heaven's name, could I do? It wasn't Manley's calf. I turned it loose to go back where it belonged. With a VP on its ribs. Kent was staring at her curiously. "'Well, I don't care. Fifty VPs couldn't make the calf manlies. If anybody came and saw that cow, why—' Val looked at him rather pityingly, as if she could not quite understand how he could even question her upon that point. "'And, after all,' she added forlornly, "'he's my husband. I couldn't—' I had to do what I could to shield him, just for sake of the past, I suppose. Much as I despise him, I can't forget that—that that I cared once. It's because I wanted your advice that I— It's a pity you didn't get it sooner, then. Can't you see what you've done? Why, think a minute. A VP calf running with a wishbone cow. Why, it's— you couldn't advertise man as a rustler any better if you tried. The first fellow that runs into that cow and calf, well, he won't need to do any guessing. He'll know. It's a ticket to Deer Lodge, that VP calf. Now do you see? He turned away to the window and stood looking absently at the brown hillside, his hands thrust deep into his pockets. And there's Fred DeGarmo with his new job, ranging around the country, just aching to scent somebody and show his authority. It's a matter of days, almost. He'd like nothing better than to get a whack at man, even if the wishbone— Outside they could hear Polycarp throwing the wood off the wagon. Knowing him as they did, they knew it would not be long before he found an excuse for coming into the house. He had more than once evinced a good deal of interest in Kent's visits there, and shown an unmistakable desire to know what they were talking about. They had never paid much attention to him, but now even Val felt a vague uneasiness lest he overhear. 
She had been sitting, her face buried in her arms, crushed beneath the knowledge of what she had done. "'Don't worry, little woman,' Kent went over and passed his hand lightly over her hair. "'You did what looked to you to be the right thing, the honest thing, and the chances are he'd get caught before long anyhow. I don't reckon this is the first time he's done it.' "'Oh, but to think, to think that I should do it, when I wanted to save him. He, can't I despise him? He has killed all the love I ever felt for him, killed it over and over. But if anybody finds that calf, and, and if they, can't, I shall go crazy if I have to feel that I sent him to prison. To think of him shut up there, and to know that I did it. I can't bear it. She caught his arm. She pressed her forehead against it. Kent, isn't there some way to get it back? If I should find it and, and shoot it and pay the wishbone what it's worth, oh, any amount, or shoot the cow, or... She raised her face imploringly to his. Tell me, pal, or I shall go stark raving mad. Polycarp came into the kitchen, and, from the sound, he was trying to enter as unobtrusively as possible, even to the extent of walking on his toes. "'Go see what that darned old sneak wants,' Kent commanded, in an undertone. "'Act as if nothing happened, if you can.' He watched anxiously, while she drew a long breath, pressed her hands hard against her cheeks, closed her lips tightly, and then, with something like composure, went quietly to the door and threw it open. Polycarp was standing very close to it on the other side. He drew back a step. "'I wondered if I'd better get another load now I've got the team hooked up,' he began in his rasping nasal voice, his slit-like eyes peering inquisitively into the room. "'Hello, Kenneth!' I thought that was your horse standing outside. Or would you rather I cut up a pile? I don't know but what I'll have to go to town tomorrow or next day. Maybe I'd better cut you some wood, hey? If man ain't likely to be home, maybe... I think, Polycarp, we'll have a storm soon, so it would be good policy to haul another load, don't you think? I can manage very well with what there is cut until Manley returns and there are always small branches that I can break easily with the axe. I really think it would be safer to have another load hauled now while we can. Don't you think so? Val even managed to smile at him. If my head wasn't so bad, she added deceitfully, I should be tempted to go along, just for a dose sight of the river. Mr. Burmett is going directly. Perhaps I may walk down later on. But you had better not wait. I shouldn't want to keep you working till dark. Polycarp, eyeing her and Kent, and the room in all its details, forced his hand into his trousers pocket, brought up his battered plug of tobacco, and pried off a piece, which he rolled into his left cheek with his tongue. Just as you say, he surrendered though it was perfectly plain that he would much prefer to cut wood and so be able to see all that went on, even though he was denied the gratification of hearing what they said. He waited a moment, but Val turned away, and even had the audacity to close the door upon his unfinished reply. He listened for a moment, his head craned forward. "'Purty kind of goin's on,' he mumbled. Time man had a flea put in his ear by Granny if he don't want to lose that yeller-eyed wife of his'n. To Polycarp, a closed door, when a man and woman were alone upon the other side, could mean nothing but surreptitious kisses and the like. He went stumbling out and drove away down the coulee, his head turning automatically so that his eyes were constantly upon the house. From his attitude, as Kent saw him through the window, Polycarp expected an explosion at the very least. 
his outraged virtue vested itself in one more sentence pretty blamed nervy by granny to go and shut the door right in my face inside the room val stood for a minute with her back against the door as if she half feared polycarp would break in and drag her secret from her when she heard him leave the kitchen she drew a long breath eloquent in itself when the rattle of the wagon came to them there she left the door and went slowly across the room until she stood close to kent the interruption had steadied them both her voice was a constrained calm when she spoke well is there anything i can do because i suppose every minute is dangerous kent kept his eyes upon the departing polycarp there's nothing you can do no maybe i can do something soon as that granny gossip is out of sight i'll go and round up that cow and calf if somebody hasn't beaten me to it val looked at him with a certain timid helplessness oh will you won't it be against the law if you if you kill it she grew slightly excited again kent you shall not get into any trouble for for his sake if it comes to a choice why let him suffer for his crime you shall not kent turned his head slowly and gazed down at her don't run away with the idea i'm doing it for him he told her distinctly i love man fleetwood like i love a wolf but if that v p calf catches him up you'd fight your head over it god only knows how long i know you you'd think so much about the part you played that you'd wind up by forgetting everything else you'd get to thinking of him as a martyr maybe no it's for you i kind of got you into this you recollect if i'd let you see man drunk that day you'd never have married him i know that now so i'm going to get you out of it my side of the question can wait she stared up at him with a grave understanding but you know what i said you won't do anything that can make you trouble won't you tell me kent what you're going to do he had already started to the door but he stopped and smiled reassuringly nothing so fierce if i can find him i aim to bar out that v p sabe End of chapter 19Chapter 20 of Lonesome Land by B. M. Bauer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 A Blotched Brand. At the brow of the hill, which was the western rim of the coulee, Kent turned and waved a farewell to Val, watching him wistfully from the kitchen door. She had wanted to go along, she had almost cried to go and help but kent would not permit her and beneath the unpleasantness of denying her anything there had been a certain primitive joy in feeling himself master of the situation and of her actions for that one time it was as if she belonged to him at the last he had accepted the field glasses which she insisted upon lending him and now he was tempted to take them from their worn leathern case and focus them upon her face just for the meager satisfaction of one more look at her. But he rode on out of sight, for the necessity which drove him forth did not permit much loitering if he would succeed in what he had set out to do. Personally he would have felt no compunctions whatever about letting the calf go, a walking advertisement of Manley's guilt. It seemed to him a sort of grim retribution, and no more than he deserved. He had not exaggerated his sentiments when he intimated plainly to her his hatred of manley and he agreed with her that the fellow was making a despicable return for the kindness his neighbors had always shown him no doubt he had stolen from the double diamond as well as the wishbone once kent pulled up half minded to go back and let events shape themselves without any interference from him but there was val 
women were so queer about such things. It seemed to Kent that if any man had caused him as much misery as Manley had caused Val, he would not waste much time worrying over him if he tangled himself up with his own misdeeds. However, Val wanted that bit of evidence covered up. So, while Kent did not approve, he went at the business with his customary thoroughness. The field glasses were a great convenience. More than once they saved him the trouble of riding a mile or two to inspect a small bunch of stock. Nevertheless, he rode for several hours before, just at sundown, he discovered the cow feeding alone with her calf in a shallow depression near the rough country next the river. They were wild, and he ran them out of the hollow and up on high ground before he managed to drop his loop over the calf's head. "'You sure are a dandy fine signpost, all right,' he observed, and grinned down at the staring V.P. brand. "'It's a pity you can't be left that way.' He glanced cautiously around him at the great empty prairie. A mile or two away, a lone horseman was loping leisurely along, evidently bound for the double diamond. "'Say, this is kind of public,' Kent complained to the calf. "'Let's you and me go down out of sight for a minute.' He started off toward the hollow, dragging the calf, a protesting bundle of stiffened muscles pulling against the rope. The cow, shaking her head in a half-hearted defiance, followed. Kent kept an uneasy eye upon the horseman, and hoped fervently the fellow was absorbed in meditation, and would not glance in his direction. Once he was almost at the point of turning the calf loose, for barring out brands, even illegal brands, is justly looked upon with disfavor, to say the least. Down in the hollow, which Kent reached with a sigh of relief, he dismounted and hastily started a little fire on a barren patch of ground beneath a jutting sandstone ledge. The calf, tied helpless, lay nearby, and the cow hovered close, uneasy but lacking courage for a rush. Kent laid hand upon his saddle, hesitated, and shook his head. He might need it in a hurry and cinturing takes time both in the removal and the replacement, and is vitally important with all. His knife he had lost on the last round-up. He scowled at the necessity, lifted his heel, and took off a spur. "'And if that darn Jinny don't get too blamed curious and come foggin' over this way—' He spoke the phrase aloud, out of the middle of a mental arrangement of the chance he was taking. To heat the spur red-hot, draw it across the fresh V.P. again and again, and finally drag it crisscross once or twice to make assurance an absolute certainty, did not take long. Kent was particular about not wasting any seconds. The calf stopped its dismal blatting, and when Kent released it and coiled his rope, it jumped up and ran for its life, the cows ambling solicitously at its heels. Kent kicked the dirt over the fire, eyed it sharply a moment to make sure it was perfectly harmless, mounted in haste, and rode up the sloping side down which he had come. Just under the top of the slope he peeked anxiously out over the prairie, ducked precipitately, and went clattering away down the hollow to the farther side, dodged around a spur of rocks forced his horse down over a wicked jumble of boulders to level land below, and rode as if a hangman's noose were the penalty for delay. When he reached the river, which he did after many windings and turnings, he got off and washed his spur, scrubbing it diligently with sand in an effort to remove the traces of fire. When the evidence was at least less conspicuous, he put it on his heel and jogged down the river bank quite innocently, inwardly thankful over his escape. He had certainly done nothing wrong, but one sometimes finds it rather awkward to be forced into an explanation of a perfectly righteous deed. If I'd been stealing that calf, I'd never have been crazy enough to take such a long chance, 
he mused, and laughed a little. I'll bet Fred thought he was due to grab a rustler right in the act, only he was a little bit slow about making up his mind. Deputy stock inspectors had ought to think quicker than that. He was just about five minutes too deliberate. I'll gamble he's scratching his head right now, over that blotched brand, trying to sabe the play, which he won't, not in a thousand years. He gave the reins a twitch and began to climb through the dusk to the lighter hilltop, at a point just east of Cold Spring Coulee. At the top he put the spurs to his horse and headed straight as might be for the Wishbone Ranch. He would like to have told Val of his success, but he was afraid Manley might be there, or Polycarp. It was wise always to avoid Polycarp Jenks if one had anything to conceal from his fellows. End of chapter 20